following lecture was produced by Gloria and Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Often when we speak about the end of the world, or the end of civilization, or the apocalypse, a great deal of emotions are stirred, stirred up inside of us. We become solemn, and this may be appropriate because it's a very serious matter. But we need to investigate what, el what else appears in our mind when we begin to speak about the apocalypse or a great catastrophe or cataclysm. What bubbles up to the surface of our mind? Usually, a lot of feelings, fear, feelings of insecurity, something uncomfortable inside of us. And so we feel a repulsion or an aversion from wanting to speak about such topics or to bring them up brings up all of these uncomfortable feelings that we'd rather often avoid. And this is very prevalent in our modern culture of not wanting to speak about these things or even being accused of being a fear monger and spreading fear but where what is the source of that fear where is it coming from when we talk about preparation for the Gnostic apocalypse we may first think about how to save ourselves, how to save this civilization, our little world, our material items, to save our life. The word apocalypse is Greek, and it means to unveil, or the unveiling, to reveal. So when we speak about it, Something is unveiled inside of us. We maybe start to feel that insecurity. In Buddhism, they talk about the two truths, the two truths doctrine. Very profound. And all the schools of Buddhism deal with it in a little bit different way. They have different metaphysical and philosophical concepts related to these two truths. Many times those two truths are translated in English as uh, the relative truth and the ultimate truth. Or the empirical truth and absolute truth. Two levels of, of truth. But a better, or what I prefer, translation of this relative truth is obscurated truth. So the word obscurated truth, that word obscurated means to scour something, and ob means put on top of. 
So obscurated truth is a truth which something has been placed on top of. And if we borrow a Greek word, we could say the apocalyptic truth is that truth which unveils itself when that obscuration has been removed. Samael Anveor often speaks about the apocalypse or the final catastrophe. And he writes, The physical, psychological, and spiritual worlds conjointly co correspond with each other through the 32 paths of light, which are the sacred steps of the Holy Ladder. The great catastrophe which is approaching has a triple consequence, physical, psychological, and spiritual. So if we were to analyze this, we are going to take a look at those three aspects. We are often very curious, what is going to happen? In these studies, we talk about the end times. The, uh, Master Samael Unveor wrote several books regarding the topic, such as The Doomed Aryan Race, The Aquarian Message, and various lectures as well. And it is important to understand where our culture and civilization and world is going in a physical respect. But it is more important for us to look at our psychological and spiritual process. Because the true apocalypse is something psychological and spiritual. I mean, the, the real truth, the ultimate truth, is that we are all physically here, born, we will have a life, and we will die. And that is the nature of what we are right now. And the nature of this civilization will pass away. So to state something like we are all going to die is just a simple fact. But what does that have to do with this final catastrophe or the apocalypse? If we are all going to die anyway, why is it so important to look at this from a worldly perspective? I once was uh, questioned about some of these prophecies and I gave a response that tried to cut through what I, I was attempting to cut through some of the obscurations, I could say. And I, and I said just that fact, that we should be more concerned what's going on psychologically because everything is going to pass away anyway. We're all going to die. We are physically going to die. That is going to happen. So whether or not it is in some cataclysm or whether it is some through other process, of our own natural or accidental cause, we should be more concerned with what's going on psychologically as opposed to being overly concerned with physically when and what is going to happen. Unfortunately, a lot of people do teach and talk about this topic based upon fear. A lot of teachers may even speak based upon fear, and they may transmit that unconsciously to students as well. And this is incorrect. It's one thing to be shocked, to have a shock of the consciousness, to have a moment of wakefulness because of, of being presented with that unobscured truth, and to use that as motivation to further our work to complete the unveiling. But it's something else to work based upon fear. The motto of this whole civilization could be the search for security. We are searching for security. And how do we pursue it? We get a job. We accumulate wealth so that we won't be poor. We don't want or we are afraid of what will happen we want physical security. We're afraid of people not liking us. Afraid of not being loved. Afraid of being abandoned. And even being spiritually abandoned. Many students ask, I've been, do I've been practicing these teachings and things are getting 
worse, or I feel like things are getting worse. I feel like God has abandoned me. I've, I've seen that statement made numerous times. The fear of, imba- of abandonment. So what's the antidote to this? Obviously, there's a psychological work that we often speak of. We repeat it numerous times. Of needing to analyze, to comprehend, to eliminate our ego, to eliminate our fear. When we see that fear or some insecurity or feeling of being uncomfortable, we cannot run away from it. It would be foolish to run away from it. It would be better to sit with it to see it arising and passing away in our own consciousness, in our own mind. If you are awake, if you awaken in a dream and you find yourself being plunged underwater, usually if we're in that and we're not awake, what do we do? We're afraid. We want to pull ourselves up to the top and breathe air. But if you were to awaken in that, if you were to awaken to your fear, you would realize that you're dreaming. And there'd be no harm in breathing that water. So learning how to breathe in new circumstances is really the challenge. We have to breathe in and through our fears to comprehend it. If we run away from it, if we base our spiritual aspirations upon fear, what possibly can be the outcome? We have to base our work on love and wisdom, compassion. How do we get there? In Buddhism, they talk about The impermanence of phenomenon, the emptiness of phenomenon, the interdependence of phenomenon. And they also talk about compassion, loving kindness. We can summarize this from a Western context as love and wisdom. We need to base our work upon those factors, but we can only truly know what it means to love if we truly understand what impermanence is, what emptiness is. There's no shortcut there. Because without that basis, we'll always be confused as to what our situation is. What what, what does it mean to, to base our work upon compassion and love? All things pass away. Nothing exists forever. And nothing exists in and of itself. We believe we understand that, but if those feelings of fear, if those feelings of insecurity rise to the top and we become, we have the the fortune to become in contact with them, we must assume that there's this feeling of insecurity. What is the basis of it? It's a basis of permanence of the ego wanting to sustain itself. Therefore, we're not, we haven't comprehended it yet. So these topics are very interesting, not just to learn a theory or a concept, which is useful, but to base it on how we relate to these facts. Because what are, what are the facts of our, our, of our world? If you've read some of these books or some of the other lectures, we have a whole lecture series on the book of Revelation. And as I mentioned previously, there's books about great catastrophes. If we look we see that we had the First World War, which was supposedly at that time the war to end all wars. But it was just the beginning. It set, just the, it set the foundation for another world war very soon afterwards. Right? 
And the question is, you know, will there be another world war? And it's very interesting to contemplate that. First of all, immediately, what rises in us? Fear? Is that, that should motivate us to awaken our consciousness. But the question that I ask is, how could there not be another world war? How, if you analyze the real root causes and conditions, it's not about politics and borders. It's about human fears. It's about the search for security. It's about myself and another person. We will kill someone else for that security. Has any of that changed have we changed our human consciousness on this civilization? Have those factors been dissolved? I would question that. And if we know that those factors are involved in, in, those, in the culmination of a war in the past, what would change it for the future? We all wish for this golden age. We want the golden age. We want the security. And we do speak about a golden age. But all these other New Age philosophers and mystics assume, erroneously, that a golden age can arrive from a pile of rotting rubbish. That a golden age of peace and light can arrive from our state of mind right now. There's no foundation for it. If we wish to build a building, we need a good foundation. The foundation has to be good cannot build a wonderful structure on a faulty foundation. And what is this culture based on? Where's the foundation? Where's the epicenter of this whole world? In the cities, in business, in the big cities, in the business di district. And those big cities are like huge chakras, transforming energy. And our civilization is based on the, the transmission of mostly money, right? And what's going on in those places is it's not love and compassion. It's people identified with this world. It's not really based on anything, right? So if we look at what has humanity learned, has it, has it learned the value of impermanence. We had two buildings fall down in New York City. And what a catastrophe that was. And what an eruption of emotion that it caused in every individual. And in the nation and in the world. And what did we learn from it? What is different now? What is, where, how is our psyche different than it was before? Has it taught us a lesson? Do we... Do we Know more about impermanence now? I would think it's a good question to contemplate. Where am I at? What can I assume about today? Where's my work at today, psychologically? Do I see through the eyes of impermanence? Do I see through that? What is my day to day? I would estimate that we did not learn anything from it. We got hurt, we were in pain, we suffered, we got afraid, and we got angry. As a majority, as a culture, that was the response. And then we settled down back to where we wanted to be again. The veil was lifted just a little bit. It upset us, we got angry, and we're trying very hard to put the veil back. So these are signs. I mean, this, this is where society is going. So it is, is it a, a downer to talk about it? From a conventional truth, maybe. But what about the ultimate truth? The reality? You know, why are we so afraid of death? We want to veil it. We want to cover it up, right? We don't want to look at that part of our society. And we are attached to birth. We should be able to see both of those phenomena as just a continuum. And one is, you know, a life that's well lived 
death is a celebration of it. In traditions that talk about, that have more of a, they more, they, they more clearly articulate the cycles of birth and death, so when that soul enters into those realms of, of between life and death, that soul, very different things can happen. We've summarized them in other lectures, so I won't go into it. But as Samuel Anveyor often states, that soul will be attracted either by karmic forces or by fascination into, the, into a womb, into a new womb, and in, to live again in this valley of bitterness. And yet we celebrate it. But I'm not saying that we, that we are wrong in that. I'm just saying we need to look at the full continuum of what birth and death is. That life is just the in-between two other endpoints, and those endpoints are just in-between the two other endpoints. Everything is a bardo. Everything is a, a continuum, a transmission. So really the major content of this lecture is not to talk about certain facts that prophecies and put it all together and form an intellectual synopsis, which can be helpful. But that's already well outlined in numerous books. But we will talk about it from a general perspective. So firstly, if we talk about the physical aspect of the apocalypse, if we continue on the, the stream of consciousness I was talking about, we can look at the prophecy of Melchizedek. <clears throat> and I will, I will read it for you. He, his prophecy is as follows. Men, or better said, rational mammals, will gradually forget their souls to only take care of their bodies. The greatest corruption will reign on earth. Men will resemble ferocious beasts, thirsty for their brother's blood. The half moon will darken, and its adepts will fall in perpetual war. The greatest misfortunes will fall upon them, and they will fight each other. The crowns of kings, great and small, will fall. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A terrible war among all peoples will break out. The oceans will roar. The earth and the bottoms of the seas will be covered in bones. Kingdoms will disappear. Entire populations will die. Famine, disease, crimes not covered by the laws, never seen, neither dreamed of by men. Then the enemies of God and the divine spirit that lie in man himself will come. Those who raise their hands against others will perish as well. The forgotten and the persecuted will rise later. They will be the center of the attention of the whole world. There will be thick darkness, horrible storms. Mountains, until then arid, will be covered with forests. Earth will be shaken. Millions of men will exchange the chains of slavery and humiliations for hunger, pestilence, and death. Roads will be crowded with people walking randomly from one place to another. The greatest, most beautiful cities will disappear in fire. One, two, three. Out of 10,000 men, one will survive, and he will be naked, deprived of reason and lacking strength to build a shelter or find food. And these starving men will bark like mad wolves. They will devour corpses and bite their own flesh, and they will challenge God for combat. Earth will be deserted, and even God will leave. Only death and night will be on the empty earth. Then I will send a group of people, 
in parentheses, the World Salvation Army. Until then unknown, who, with strong hands, will remove the weeds from the cultivating field of vice and will lead the few faithful to the spirit of man in the battle against evil. They will found a new life on earth, purified by the death of nations. We have to take the responses that we feel inside of ourselves when we read something like that. And we have to cut straight through to the reality. We have to go straight into the unobscured truth and work with it. To not read this and just turn away, or to read this and get overwhelmed with sadness or fear, but rather see how it can help us be liberated. See how this can help us transform or revolutionize our own consciousness. The word catastrophe means a revolution. So we, this needs to cause a great catastrophe in our mind, a revolution of our mind. Can remember this, not because we're trying to be morbid, but because we can see a kernel of truth there, and it's only through that kernel of truth that we can make our way to the light. There is a group of masters called the Guardian Wall of Humanity. These are a group of highly ascended beings, resurrected masters, that manage the karma of the whole earth. Guardian wall to what? It's the guardian wall of our own karma. So that can help us cultivate something. Without that guardian wall, everything would have already occurred. All the karma would have just caused that great catastrophe and calamity already. So we should be grateful. So we can transform these feelings into gratuity. Into one-pointed concentration. To cut through all of our cravings and aversions for these daily nonsensical desires. Things that we waste our time with. To cut through it. And take advantage of here and now to awaken. So we teach how to meditate. We teach how to work and cultivate our mind with a science. And the science doesn't matter how much you believe or how much you pray to God. It matters how much you do that work and that effort. Of course, God is a part of it. There was this, a analogy I recently heard and related to the First World War, so I'll bring it up. I think it was the first year of fighting on Christmas Eve. You know, people are killing each other the day before Christmas Eve. And then most of the people fighting were Christian. So on Christmas Eve, they just... Both sides, or all the, all the fighting sides, had this spontaneous desire to not fight. So they stopped. And they sang Christmas carols. And they actually played, I think, soccer or something like that. Or football. On Christmas. And then the next day, all the generals wanted to force them to start killing each other again with machine guns and chlorine gla- gas, and they refused. They said, I just, I just was having fun with my, with my brethren, and now you want me to kill him. And they refused. So the generals just moved the armies around to different parts of the line, and then the fighting proceeded, and they started killing each other again. When we teach meditation... We teach more than just achieving a nice state of consciousness. We learn how to meditate. We can cultivate our mind. 
We can ch ach achieve a state of, of uh, mental equipoise where, where the mind becomes very settled. It's a very nice experience. But we teach more than that. Because many schools will only teach that. They'll only teach, you, you relax, you, you cultivate a nice state of mind, and it's good. It is good. But then eventually it ends and you go back and on your way. The battle continues. When we achieve that state of mind, that's like a truce in our own mind. The two things aren't battling anymore. and We have a little reprieve. It's called um, shamatha in, in uh, many traditions. Mental equipoise. If we don't combine that with insight, if we don't combine that with looking into ourself, then it's the same thing as that a little analogy. The war stops, you have a nice little vacation, but then you do nothing to look at the causes as to why people are killing each other. If you're achieving meditation, if you're achie achieving mental equipoise, it's very nice. But if, you are doing, if you're not looking into yourself and analyzing the causes, conditions of your own mind, then you'll go out of meditation and the battle of opposites will continue. So we need more than just mental equipoise. We need insight. We need imaginative knowledge, intuitive knowledge, clairvoyance. We need to learn how to go out of the body. We need to learn how to awaken in our dreams in order to look, to see, to gain knowledge. So that's why we teach in this, in this tradition more than just a certain stage of meditation. We need to change. So there is that quote that uh, the Master Samael writes is that what's fundamental is change, to summarize. If, we're, if our life is not changing, if we're not looking back and seeing how, our, how we have changed for the better, then we really need to analyze what's going on. From day to day, it's very difficult to see that. But if you look back a year, six months, or two years, or five years, and you can see the type of person you were, and you can, if you can see, I've been developing something there, well then that's good, that's progress, that's, that's evident. But we always have to be careful with looking into our problems further and further. And that is why, you know, the Second World War and now an inevitable, another war, world war is going to occur is because all we're looking for are vacations. We're looking to get away, to escape our life. And how do we escape? Well, we go to another, we go to another country or it's nice and warm and we can sit on the beach for a while. A vacation is appropriate. I'm, I'm not totally saying there's no, vacations are never appropriate. But they refresh us so that we can live life. And if we're living right, we're looking into ourselves and changing. But we want to escape. We just want to escape just for escaping. And if we don't escape with a physical vacation, we want to escape with a mental vacation, an emotional vacation. We wish to sit in front of a screen and fall asleep and so we don't have to worry about our, our problems of this world and get... Uh, focused and identified with some drama. Or we want to subdue or even cover up our problems with more intoxicants. We're already intoxicated with our state of mind, but we want to put alcohol in there. Our society loves alcohol, loves cocaine, loves marijuana, loves painkillers. It's an epidemic of painkillers going on. Started by the doctors. And people just love the painkillers so much they can't stop taking them. Heroin's a, made a huge comeback. Why? Because our mind is craving. We want to forget. We don't want the pain. We believe that our pain is due to something now, but our pain is due to the, the craving of yesterday. Every time we become identified or we crave something, we sow a little seed in our mind. 
We don't know when that seed is going to come to fruition or going to flower. But all the pain that we might receive when we get that unveiled truth isn't because the truth is painful. It's because our state of mind was sown for that. We put the seeds in there ourselves with past actions, with past deeds. We've cultivated a state of mind based on desires, based on permanence. We think everything's going to be the same tomorrow as it is today and yesterday. And when it isn't, what do we feel? We don't like it. It feels painful. In the doomed Aryan race, Samael Unveil writes, One summer night, I was in that state which is known in the Eastern world as Nirvani Kalpa or Samadhi. What happened to me during that meditation was very profound. It was something marvelous. Before me, the third aspect of Prakriti took on the frightful and terribly divine shape of proserpine or hectate. And then she spoke to me in a language with apocalyptic significance. This, per, this perverse civilization of vipers, this great Babylon, will be destroyed. And in all of its cities, not one stone upon another will remain. The evil of, this, the, evil of the world is so great that it has even reached unto heaven. There is no remedy for this humanity. It is totally lost. Then, overflowing with great terror, I uttered, O oh, mother of mine, we are on a dead-end street. Then, with a parable, Proserbine asked me, Do you want to make a covenant with me? Yes, mother of mine. I am willing to fulfill that covenant. With great decisiveness came this answer from my lips. Then Proserpine, the queen of the infernos and death, took the floor again with a parable and told me, Open the dead-end street, and I will kill them. I immediately answered, I accept, mother of mine, my lady. So, the way out of this dead-end street is through death. We need to understand such a statement both physically and psychologically. Because <clears throat> when we look at the civilization, we look at this humanity, we need to also have that analogy of the cities inside of us, of all the, human the inner humanity, all the people. And what do we need to do? We need to work with the Divine Mother. There is no other way but through death will become new life. And there are many pictures <clears throat> of Kali or various fierce aspects of the feminine divine force that has the ability to decapitate, the ability to work with the serpent and the energy to de decapitate our ego. And we can see here on this picture she has a necklace of decapitated heads and a skirt of limbs. It's very gruesome, huh? What do we feel when we see that? Psychologically, we should contemplate that. It's a very profound and significant symbol that we can meditate upon. Many great yogis and Buddhas would meditate on death constantly. Padmasambhava was said to have meditated in graveyards. And he is a very high Christified master. I don't necessarily recommend meditating in graveyards. In fact, I do not recommend it. <clears throat> but the symbol is there. Meditating on our own death. What a novel idea. Very profound thing to do. And I do recommend that recommend meditating on your own physicality, the impermanence of my own body. 
Personally, I hope that when this body dies, it's cremated. I hope it burns to liberate that energy. But can you sit down and meditate that process and visualize that process? Not, not in an egotistical or macabre way, but just objectively visualizing it. That process. What appears in your mind? Fear? Attachment? Worry? And if we want to avoid that process, then what are, what are we actually here for? Supposedly, we're here to work on our fears, work on our attachments, and work on our worries. So here's a practice that can be very helpful. We should be able to get through that practice. And not only that, it should help us achieve not just insight, but a, a, a single-pointed state of consciousness. It's very effective at getting to the point. Because we are incredibly attached to our own physical image. How curious it is that we're attached to our physical image, and yet we have no concept of our psychological image. And that is the thing that has more permanence. Now, our psychological constitution is also ultimately impermanent. But that is something else we need to meditate upon. <clears throat> so, if we look at the psychological aspect, psychological apocalypse, from a lecture called Alcyone and Negative Emotions, the Master writes, There has never been a more grandiose concentration in heaven like the one on the 4th of February 1962. He's talking about the beginning of the Aquarian Age. Let us not then be surprised that from one moment to the next, our solar system will enter within the rings of Alcyone. We must prepare ourselves now. Many will not resist the radiation and will die. Physical matter will become more radioactive, more fluorescent, and this will in some way be helpful for our spiritual work. The next sentence he writes, It is clear that we must review our daily contact, conduct, we must become more reflective, more careful with our critical judgments, and especially very careful with our negative emotions. When we are in the field, when we are in the very field of psychology, we find many disorders within people. Everyone is being dragged down by negative emotions, and this is very grave. There is nothing more harmful for profound internal development than negative emotions. I found it very profound that he was speaking of one topic and then immediately transitioned to negative emotions. This radioactivity is something both material and psychological at the same time. We're going to concern ourselves with the psychological aspect. That matter is that matter we can even say the subtle matter related to our mind will be impacted by f events that are occurring on a cosmic scale. And what happens is a polarization. The waters are separated. The wheat separates from the chaff. An energy occurs. And we either are propelled up or propelled down. See, this is the real thing that we should be more concerned with, how we are behaving psychologically. Because it's, it's a matter of fact that we're all going to die. It's a matter of fact that everything in society is going to fade away. But another thing is the apocalypse of the world and the new humanity. That it's not just that are physically going to die, but the souls of this world are going to be impelled in one direction or another. The humongous waves of humanity are going to go down, to be recycled, in order to be appropriate for the new, the new heaven, the new earth. Just say the new earth. And only those people who can resist, in this sense where we say negative emotions, and this, uh, resist that energy, in fact, take that energy which can cause 
greater activity within our minds and liberate it so we can go on the ascending current. So when he says, everyone is being dragged down by negative emotions. Descending. So we believe, or I often have seen it said, that you know, we're entering into a new age, we're getting assistance, we are entering into a golden age, and we are going to be helped. And this is true, but that help comes like this activation of our ego. Are we going to use that activation to become more aware of it and separate from it and destroy it? Or are we going to just use that activation of our ego to enjoy our lusts and our identifications more? Because we will grow just a fatter ego that way. And this is what's happening. You look at society, it's already beginning to be polarized in this Aquarian dimension, Right? Intoxication through sensuous pleasures or intoxication through the divine inebriation. This polarization is already beginning. <clears throat> along this matter, along with um, how to deal with negative emotions, how to how to prepare ourselves psychologically for psychological psychological apocalypse. There is a text in Tibetan Buddhism. It's a mind training text. And it's called The Wheel of Sharp Weapons, Effectively Striking the Heart of the Foe. And I wanted to read some parts of this in order to generate some good motivation. So it starts off with, I pay heartfelt homage to you, Yama Tanka. Yama is the being holding the Bhava Chakra, the wheel of Samsara. Very fierce, that's, that's the Lord of Death. Tanka means to eliminate. So Yama Tanka is the slayer of death or the terminator of death. So I pay heartfelt homage to you, Yamantanka. Your wrath is opposed to the great lord of death. In jungles of poisonous plants strut the peacocks. Though medicine gardens of beauty lie near, the masses of peacocks don't find gardens pleasant, but thrive on the essence of poisonous plants. In similar fashion, the brave bodhisattvas Remain in the jungle of worldly concern. No matter how joyful this world's pleasure gardens, these brave ones are never attracted to pleasures, but thrive in the jungle of suffering and pain. We spend our whole lives in search for enjoyment, yet tremble with fear at the mere thought of pain. Thus, since we are cowards, we are miserable still. But the brave bodhisattvas accept suffering gladly and gain from their courage a true lasting joy. Now, desire is like, desire is the jungle of poisonous plants here. Only brave ones like peacocks can thrive on such fare. If cowardly beings like crows were to try it, because they are greedy, they might lose their lives. How can someone who cherishes self more than others Take lust in such dangerous poisons for food? If he tried like a crow to use other delusions, he would probably forfeit his chance for release. And thus bodhisattvas are likened to peacocks. They live on delusions, those poisonous plants. Transforming them into the essence of practice, they thrive in the jungle of everyday life. Whatever is presented, they always accept while destroying the poison of clinging desire. Uncontrollable wandering through rounds of existence is caused by our grasping at egos as real. This ignorant attitude heralds the demon of selfish concern for our welfare alone. We seek some security for our own egos. We want only pleasure and shun any pain 
But now we must banish all selfish compulsion and gladly take hardship for all others' sake. It's a very, very beautiful poem. And I believe there's about 80 or 100 verses. And it continues on for a long time. But we can see how this is very much in alignment with our work. It's very inspiring. This is the cultivation of an attitude. Or a cult- when they say it's mind, there's a Tibetan school called, um, or series of texts called mind training. And what they're really, another translation of that is attitude training. We are cultivating a certain type of attitude. And this is a bodhisattva attitude. The bodhisattva can transform the poisons. But we can't transform it from an egotistical perspective. We can't transform it living as a crow, which is the symbol here, the crow being the egotistical type of uh, worldly view. We have to, what we call in this tradition, transform the impressions, transform the poisons. So on this slide, this is Yamatanka. Very fierce. He has many sharp weapons in all of his hands. He's trampling many defeated foes underneath. He's showing his strength, his virility. He has a crown of skulls. He's very fierce, but he is a very good and dear friend on the path. So I will quote another section, beginning with verse 49. As it's true what I've said about self-centered interests, I recognize clearly my enemy now. I recognize clearly the bandit who plunders, the liar who lures by pretending he's part of me. Oh, what relief that I've conquered this doubt. And so, Yamatanka, spin round with great power the wheel of sharp weapons of good actions now. Three times turn it round in your wrathful-like aspect. Your legs set apart for the two grades of truth, with your eyes blazing open for wisdom and means. Bearing your fangs of the four great opponents, devour the foe, our cruel selfish concern, with your powerful mantra of cherishing others. Demolish this enemy lurking within. Frantically running through life's tangled jungle, we are chased by sharp weapons of wrongs we have done. Returning upon us, we are out of control. This sly, deadly villain, this selfishness in us, deceiving ourselves and all others as well. Capture him, capture him, fierce Yamatanka. Summon this enemy, bring him forth now. Batter him, batter him. Rip out his heart of our grasping for ego, our love for ourselves. Trample him. Trample him, dance on the head of this treacherous concept of selfish concern. Tear out the heart of this self-centered butcher who slaughters our chance to gain final release. Final release, of course, being nirvana. So I really recommend reading a text like this if you feel in the wrong state of mind, if you feel brought down or dragged down by negative emotions. There are different ways to cultivate positive emotions. And, and reading a poem like this, or reading some other books of the master, that's a way to cultivate a positive attitude, to not be brought down by our negative emotions, to not take on a very dreary and depressing take on the work, Sometimes we can get into that mode. Some students really, they, they take some of the humility that we're supposed to cultivate to be humble, and they, they, they almost incessantly whip themselves, needing to cause more pain to uh, really talk badly about themselves inappropriately. They kind of take on a very uh, dreary aspect of trying to do the work. And they miss that they are an essence, which is a part of the spirit, part of God. And they have worth and value.
but just not as a personality, not as an ego. We need to cultivate the right view there as well. So as I said, this is a very good text. And you can read the whole thing. Um, it's on various places online if you just search for it. It's very nice. So the final aspect of this apocalypse that I want to talk about, we talked physically, psychologically, and spiritually is the third aspect. <coughs> and spiritually is the most obviously elevated. I'll probably spend the least amount of time speaking about it. Uh, let me back up, and this is another slide about the psychological aspect, because... <clears throat> in the book of Revelation, there's many, many symbols. Um, in Revelation uh, 1, chapter 1, verse 11, it speaks about sending the word, or to, yeah, to send the word, write it in a book and send it to the seven churches which, in, which are in Asia. But really that word Asia is a, what we call a Kabbalistic blind, or a symbol of Asia, which is the physical world, which is related to our physical and vital bodies, and even our soul. And those seven churches are related to our seven chakras. And we've spoken about this many times in the past. So again, people look at Revelation, and there's many people who have made many, many different interpretations of, of Revelation. But the important interpretation is not so much physically, but what happens psychologically and spiritually. That's the important thing. So psychologically, we begin by writing in a book. And that book is written with our actions, with our deeds. We are that book. And we begin to activate or we send the word or those deeds to the seven churches, we activate those centers in our body. <clears throat> but later on, when we, when we focus on the spiritual aspect of, our apoc of the apocalypse, we'll just briefly look at some parts of Revelation related to the seven seals. And that's, how, and that's, what we're, that's where we will end. <clears throat> So Revelation, right, in Revelation is written, And I saw in the right hand of him that, that sat on the throne a book written within, within and on the back side, meaning our spinal column, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book? and loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. These seven seals cannot be opened by any man. So this aspect of the apocalypse is related to a spiritual revolution, a spiritual unveiling. That the very essence, at the very core, at the very substance of our reality, we can say is Christ. We can say is that lamb of seven eyes and seven horns that exists at the root nature of everything. So those seven seals are a process of spiritual purification. We don't achieve the seven seals in relationship to those seven serpents of fire we often speak of. The seven, there are the seven serpents of fire, and then there's the seven serpents of light. And only the person who is going beyond the stage of being a man and becoming a superman or becoming a resurrected 
master achieves those unloosening of the seal because only Christ can do it. And this is the real pinnacle of what the apocalypse is. It's not the physical apocalypse. Psychological apocalypse is more important, but the, more, the pinnacle is the spiritual apocalypse. This is the true apocalypse. This is the true unveiling because at the root, the true unobscured truth is that substance of Christ. That's at the true root. But to achieve that is a very long process. So this is a very short summary that those seven seals are related to the venistic initiations related to the serpents of light. The first seal is related to the white horse. The second seal is related to the red horse. The third seal is related to the, the appearance of the black horse, which is related to the Christification of the astral body. The fourth seal is related to the yellow horse, related to the mind, the Christification of the mind. And there are the fifth, which is related to Tifereth. The sixth seal related to the Buddhic body. And the seventh seal related to the Atmic body. And even beyond then, there's other degrees. And it is written that he who is faithful unto death shall receive a crown of life. Shall receive the crown of life. And that is related to the top triangle. So when you look at the imagery of the book of Revelation, you see cataclysms, you see death. You see war and pestilence and bitterness and wormwood. You see the sun and the moon turning dark. And this is all true, but the end point is light. The end point is freedom. And we cannot achieve that freedom without going through that process. So, how do we prepare for the Gnostic apocalypse? We do so by looking at ourselves physically, psychologically, and spiritually. And how do we respond to it? How do we cultivate a good state of mind? How do we transform ourselves? Where is true security? And how deeply do we know where that true security is? Can we rely on it? Do we have faith as conscious works, as experience, as knowledge? The two words Gnostic and Apocalypse are Greek. Gnostic meaning knowledge. Apocalypse meaning unveiling. So, the unveiling of knowledge. The problem is, we have been obscuring that knowledge for so long we've made bad mistakes and we have to do a lot of work and a lot of effort for that unveiling and as the apocalypse occurs physically events are processing as they are processing and that forces us internally to process it to uncover to unveil to go through our own apocalypse and if we are unable to do it on under our own will under our own work, through our own deed, then it will happen for us, but in an inferior sense. It will happen for us, but we will gain nothing for it. We will be cleaned. The apocalypse will happen, but in a sense that no knowledge will be gained. That would not be a Gnostic apocalypse. That would be an ignorant apocalypse. So we want to achieve that unveiling, the, and that cleaning, and that purification through a Gnostic effort, through knowledge. That is how we prepare. Do you have any questions? That knowledge uh, is always revealed to the dead. Everything that grows appears out of the refuse of death. Every beautiful flower grows from the mud of the earth. All of our virtues will grow from our 
poisoned minds if we know how to break it down and use it for our virtues. And that's how nature works. It's very beautiful. We could take advantage of that. Without this apocalypse of the earth, there could not be a future humanity. There could not be a new ascension, a new, a new heaven and earth. There would be no material for it. All the material is stuck in here. It needs to be recycled. When we use the word recycled, it's not just um, an analogy. Literally, the energy as we take out the aggregations of energy, which are which are our mind, our psychology, as we take out. Our, our lunar bodies, our subtle lunar bodies related to our ego, have to go out. The energy has to be liberated, and that same energy has to be used for the evolving essences and souls. So it is necessary. I think I understand your question. Yes. When we sacrifice our ego, we are liberating the energy, and it can be used in the process of re being recycled. So if every single, if everybody in this earth was able to sacrifice their ego, truly, they would be moving enough energy to change the way that these events would occur. I don't want to say it would ob obviate the apocalypse. That's different. Because we need to, just as physically we're going to die, one way or another. Right? But the events of how it all occur would be much different. Right? If we all developed an astral body, we'd receive the first level of continuous consciousness. Physical body would die. We would be able to be in another space. You know, everything would be different. So many different factors. Does that answer your question? So, yes, the answer is yes, because if there's, there's something happening related to Alcyon's rings and entering into it is changing some of the correspondences and, and um, relationships physically, chemically, molecularly, it's also changing some relationships psychologically in the higher dimensions as well. It's an analogy. Uh, everything is relative to something else. So s if you're familiar with 20th and 21st century physics and cosmology, space is only relative to time. Time is only relative to space. Energy is only relative to matter, and matter is only relative to energy. So the faster you go through space, the more the time changes. There's no objective one view of everything. Everything is a, is a relationship to something else. So... Those relationships can change while still the underlying ultimate reality remaining the same, which is the absolute. I mean, that, that's my understanding. Sometimes we talk about 
karma, and we want to know, well, what's the karma of the world versus my specific karma here? And am I really supposed to be here if the, if, and the world is about to go through all this stuff? And is it really, like, how do I manage all this? And there's no way to, there's no way to isolate one part of karma and view it just as, a, as its whole unique entity. It doesn't work like that. Karma is everything. So our individual karma is directly tied to the karma of our family, directly tied to the karma of our nation, directly tied to the karma of the earth, tied to the karma of the solar system. There's no way to just pluck it out and say it's the karma of this box is just that. And there's no, it's all interdependent. And it's all depending on what, f what view you focus it on. You know? Well, why is a symbol always decapitation? I think most most of the energy is is up here. Uh, yeah. All the senses are in the head. All the senses are in the head. Yeah. Because the way with the three primary forces too in the head. You know what the city of nine gates is? Most of the nine gates are above the neck, so we'll get rid of them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yes. Um, in revolutionary psychology, Master Samuel uh, talks a lot about that we have thousands of egos, um, and that the observation of you know an ego in any given moment and how they switch in and out of our psychology. Um, I don't completely understand. I've heard other lectures about how it's eliminated by being in a situation and transmuting that situation and making, you know, a positive decision and, you know, uh, not strengthening the ego. But I don't completely understand if there's an ego in this given moment and I observe that ego um, and I decide not to act upon the impulse given by it, that doesn't maybe eliminate it, does it? How does that, how does the elimination process happen? That's a good question. And you're, you're correct. When you have an, an, an impulse, egotistical impulse, but you don't become 100% identified with it. Uh, the fact that there's an impulse means that there's some part of yourself already in it acting. It's already, but at another level, we can re refrain from actually continuing it because we, we can catch it. That itself is helpful and it's related to what's called the transformation of impressions. When, when we're challenged by an impression, the reason why we're challenged is because something's being pulled out of our ego and we're acting in an egotistical way and we're being challenged to transform it. And sometimes we transform it well, and sometimes we don't. There's a whole degree, right? How much of an, of, does it grab our awareness and put us to sleep? But there's a whole series, there's two lectures called Gnostic Psychoanalysis Part 1 and Part 2, and other things. There's another lecture called uh, uh, Retrospective Analysis Explained that go more in depth into how to do that. Because what you do, you transform that moment the best you can. But then you have to go deeper into that moment. And the only way to go deeper to comprehend that moment is to sit in meditation. So, then you, so when you go through that moment, you deal with it the best you can. You transform it the best you can. But you know, well, there's still something going on there. I still feel that I'm still angry at that person. I'm still resentful. Or I really was identified with that moment. It really put me to sleep. I was fascinated, etc. Then when you go into meditation, that's your food for meditation. You cultivate a some level of stability and you use your imagination consciously to visualize that moment and to kind of sit in it and marinate in it and see what else approaches you what else comes up you might find other things flourishing and it's a technique and it's difficult it's difficult we some when we begin trying to cultivate our mind we might just it just might be very difficult but we we only learn through practice we learn how to visualize and concentrate and have that perfect balance between the two. Because if we become too loose and uh, sleepy, we become identified with what we're visualizing and we start dreaming. But if you hold it too tightly, then nothing appears. We get nothing out of it. So it's that perfect balance. And that balance, you know, if you learn how to ride a bike, you only learn how to ride a bike by practicing. 
getting on the bike and riding. So we learned that by practicing. Uh, I remember in one lecture it being stated that uh, the goal of meditation is not necessarily to uh, not visualize. I, that, that's not the exact quote, but uh, I'm trying to understand like when meditating, the stillness, you know, the emptiness of the mind. But then at the same time, when it comes to visualizing, those images are coming in and out. I guess my question is: I know the goal of meditation is to know the self, but what state is that self? Is it like no visualization? Is it nothing? Is it just completely being there? And if it is, then what is that? Is it no images? Is it no sounds? Usually uh, an awakened state of consciousness is luminous and clear and conscious. You know, it's, and what appears in front of you, just, there's an, a million or a myriad of different things that can happen. Um, what I was saying before, you can achieve a state of really stability and be very calm and be in a peaceful place. And as you pull, as you go deeper and deeper into meditation, you pull further and further away from the physical senses. And naturally, what erupts from your unconsciousness, uh, what the Buddhists call uh, storehouse consciousness or substrate consciousness, things start to bubble up. And you have to be very, again, that perfect concentration because if you're too tight, nothing ever bubbles up. You're just you're holding on to it too much. And if you're too loose, something bubbles up and you immediately become fascinated by it. Uh, so when you get into that vacuity, you have this kind of state of openness, something fills the vacuum. Something comes up into it. That's been my experience. And it's just that that subtlety because sometimes that vacuum state is, is filled up by just the slightest thought. The slightest thought, which is the beginning of a string, like a thread that you can follow, all the way through your, the maze of the mind to the middle, which is the minotaur. Right? And then you're, then you're really in trouble. But that's, that's the analogy. But sometimes that thought is very, very subtle. It's just a fleeting thought. And if you aren't watching your mind carefully, you'll just, uh, you'll just kind of like, oh, I'm meditating. Why am I thinking about that? Well, maybe that was the thought that you needed to follow to comprehend what your mind is going through right now. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,